record that. <laughs> All right. You guys at home can see that okay and you can hear me okay? I don't see the presentation. This is why I ask. Hear me okay, see me okay? Yep, you're good now. Thank you so much. Do you like the background? So Italian fascism is what we're going to be talking about today. Those symbols there are really quite interesting. These are fascis, and uh, can you tell what they are? Bundle They're a bundle of rods and an ax that are tied together by leather, let's say. It's, a, it's an old uh, symbol, it's an old Roman symbol. The fascists in, in Italy like old Roman symbols. We have this, I think, uh, in, in, in our Congress uh, as well. It's kind of a symbol of law and so on. But the fascists have a, a very interesting way of looking at this. And I, I think it, it, uh, it typifies fascism for us. You know, if you think about it, each and every one of these rods, these thin sticks are breakable. Right on their own, they're breakable. But if you put them all together and then you bind them tightly together, aren't they unbreakable? And so that's sort of the idea behind fascism or a fascist nation is that take all of the rods, the individuals together, put them together, force them to be together, and uh, and then the nation itself becomes unbreakable. You know, the, the government is unbreakable, the nation is strong, then well, we'll see. Uh, this fascism. That, uh, that becomes a, a political movement it is a kind of right wing, part of the right, whatever that means, uh, right wing political movement. And it is an alternative to what we saw in the 19th century as, um, as political, um, political and, and even economic organizations. Um, liberalism and Marxism, liberalism being uh, well, you go back to 1688, right, right, Bobby. Uh, the, the glorious revolution, the enlightenment. Liberalism is all about, give me one word. Freedom. Freedom. That was the right word. Freedom. Freedom for the individual. And, and then there's a whole bunch of other things, too. Like, eventually, uh, democracy, probably capitalism, if we're going to be talking about economic freedom. And so... I would say that the 19th century, the 1800s, are a really glorious time for liberalism. Would you say that too? But then also the antithesis, in many ways, of free liberalism. Marxism starts to rear its head in the latter half of the 1800s of the 19th century. And you know all about Marxism, trying to create a classless society, society of equals where everybody's cooperating and all that kind of stuff. Well. Parliamentary democracy that we get in liberalism seems to be, and maybe you could agree with me, it seems to be interest group bickering. Does that make sense? I mean, ideally it sounds great, but then in reality, I mean, for goodness sakes, look at the United States right now or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It seems like people in Congress are always just bickering and, and they're not really supporting the people or what's best for the country, they seem to be supporting lobbyists and interest groups and so on. That is even thought of way back then in the 1920s and 1930s and so on. The economy too for a liberal state seems to go up and it seems to go down. Capitalism works great sometimes, capitalism doesn't work great sometimes. And really does capitalism work great for everybody or are there winners and losers? So in the economy, you have things like the social question. And the social question is, is basically, what do you do with booms and busts? What do you do with the poor? What do you do with economic cycles? It's kind of hard to figure that stuff out. If we could figure that stuff out, then wouldn't our economy always just be humming along? And obviously, it doesn't hum along all the time, right? We have boom times and bust times even nowadays. We just don't really understand why that happens. Individualism. And liberty can be psychologically unfulfilling. 
does does that does that ring true for you at all? A little bit. But people are social animals. They like to be part of something. And and oftentimes they like to be part of something obviously much bigger than themselves. Like if you've ever been on a team of some kind and you've done something together as a team, or think bigger than that, you know, you have different kinds of prides, uh, pride from where you're from, or pride of of uh, well, back then, pride of race and, and those sorts of things. And just to, to be able to stand on a soapbox and say, I can do what I want to do with my property, and I have the freedom of this, and I have the freedom of that, it doesn't really feel great, especially if you if you don't really have those freedoms. You know, if you're some sort of um, religious minority or political minority where, where you don't really have the same rights and, and equality as everybody else. It's somehow psychologically unfulfilling to say, I have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. With Marxism, I don't really need to go, I was sort of uh, <laughs> criticizing um, liberal democracy capitalism. With Marxism, it's just so far removed from what you and I think. I think it's not hard for us to to, uh, to say, to see how that would be attractive. But fear it for just a moment, if you would please, and think about how under Marxism, there's no property, there's no religion, there's a dictatorship of the masses, everybody's equal, this, that, and the other. Uh, if you really thought that that was about to happen to you, don't you think you'd be scared of the change? Unless, well, there's two of you in here, here who are hardcore Marxists. But for the rest of us, it, 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 you know, it's hard to be scared of it now, but, thought it was going to happen, I think you'd be frightened. Fascism is all about the opposite of many of those things. And so it's all about political strength. Once again, think of the fascists. Think of this, this axe that's with the rods around it all bundled together. And you have in fascism a macho straw man, one person for whom the people look to as their guide, you know, as their leader. Oftentimes they're just referred to as the leader. And what's what's uh, magical about that, I guess, is that you have you, you don't have to make decisions. You don't have to have a bunch of different sides bickering. The macho strongman makes decisions very quickly for everybody, and is according to the people who follow the macho strongman is right all the time. So he's like a genius, a, a genius leader who is going to decide everything correctly. And there's a, there's a number of people who really like that, especially if what, they, what they're doing is bringing success, if that makes sense to you. It's easier to believe in the macho strongman if the macho strongman turns out to be right about X, Y, and Z. Also, with fascism, there's a lot of talk about, and there's, a, there's language of the left. I said that it's a right-wing movement. What, what does le left and right mean to you from what you've learned in school or, or, or how you understand left and right? Like who's in charge left and who's in charge right? Or do you, do you have any kind of sense for that? Um, the right is about either preserving a status quo or returning to a previous status quo. I like that. And the left is about pushing the status quo further and further. I like that too. Give, give me, give me, a, give me another, uh, another left-right sort of status quo. In other words, change versus no change, right? I wonder if this is change or no change. Yes, yeah, um, economically, more intervention with the use of the left wing, less. Okay, left is, is more intervention in the economy, left is maybe less intervention in the economy. Uh-huh, I think, oh, this well, like fascism, fascism is kind of like, I think it's like all over. Okay. okay, good. So they might intervene in the, in the economy, you know, quite a bit. They, they could in fascism, okay. Well, in, in fascism, as it turns out, there's a lot of talk uh, like I say, from the left, like about economic fairness and economic security and promising that everybody will be treated with respect. Um, 
as you'll see, that doesn't really pan out so, so well. It's really in some ways about the propaganda. It's about what they're saying is happening. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of go on that. But language of the left, generally though conservative, generally no change. And so things like women and the rights of women oftentimes are pushed back even to, to where they had been before. Or if you think about the freedom liberalism of women to do new things, they don't really like that so much at all. In fact, fascists tend to encourage the good old fashioned wives and mothers uh, bit of, of womanhood and, and not much more than that. Uh, in terms of society as well, not a lot of social movement or anything like that. So if we're talking about the economy, um, the old elites remain the elites for the most part and, and the old you know, undertrodden people or whatever are pretty much staying in the same place too. It's just that there's this thought that we're all united together. So don't get all upset if you're a working person. Uh, don't get high and mighty if you are an, an, an old aristocrat. You know, we're all in this together. That's more important than your class identity or how much wealth you might have. And there's kind of like a wink, wink and a nudge, nudge there as well. There's a lot of psychologically fulfilling symbols, symbols of the right. You see a lot of things like flags. Uh, you see a, th a lot of things of, of wearing the same, uh, the same outfit. We could call that uniforms, uh, anthems, means of greeting each other. You know, just a lot of sort of fanfare surrounding patriotism. It's not really patriotism. Let's face it, it's nationalism. And so um, that's, that's kind of what you see a lot of, uniforms and, uh, and groups of people being bound together in, uh, in various organizations that are paramilitary or military. It is a kind of extreme nationalism. The state above everyone else, the individual rod, pretty unimportant, quite frankly. Pull an individual rod out, break it, throw it away. The rest of the bundle stays together. You might have to do that, in fact, with some of the rods that just don't seem to work out in the fashions together. Very militaristic as well. An overemphasis on having a strong military and then dominating other countries militarily. Survival of the fittest nations. A number of years ago, now I'm recording this. A number of years ago, I'm driving around with my sons. They're probably like 10 and seven at this point in time. And they've been playing Civilization, like Civ Five or something like that. And, uh, <laughs> and so we're driving around and, and I oftentimes like to talk to them about all this stuff, you know, about fascism and communism and the history of this, that, and the other, and, and, and wonderful. Uh, so the 10 year old and I are talking about fascism. The seven year old's in the back. The seven year old says, fascism, I like fascism. <laughs> and I, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, with fascism, you get horses. And I, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but, but you know, and, and it turns out it has to do with Civ Five or whatever, that it, when you go through various kinds of, of um, political schemes or political organizations, you have benefits, you know, and I guess horses. And so <laughs> my 10 year old and I turn around, we're like, no, it's, it's not, you know, fascism's bad. You know, fascism is when the individual's will is subsumed into the greater whole of the nation and an individual doesn't matter at all. It's all about the strength of the nation and following the leader. The seven year old goes, yeah, well, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> go, Dang it. We, I have a, a few more years to change him. He's not a fascist anymore. So, so it is. Not actually for what he is. I'll ask you. This is Iluce. This is the leader. This is the strong man for Italy. And you can see, I mean, you and I can see it, right? Can, can you see the in, the in the photo on the left and even on the right, by the way, photos? Can you see the, it's, it's like a propaganda thing. It's almost like he's playing a role. Do you see that? Can you see the like, you know, I'm killing you with my eyes sort of thing or, <laughs> or uh, I'm the strong man that, that you throw your arm up and you gesticulate wildly and you scream things and you use um, hyperbole and, and bombastic language. And, you know, it's kind of like you're a, a, in some ways like a real politica, trying to manipulate the public in a way over the top kind of way. Does that make sense? And, and now if you look at a Mussolini speech, you, you kind of laugh. You're like, oh my God, people bought that. 
But at that point in time, yeah, people really ate it up. They thought he was being, you know, a, a real kind of a leader. And, and the same thing with Hitler. You just, you watch Hitler, and you're like, holy cow, really? Even if you don't understand what he's talking about, he's got sweat flying off of him, you know, and it's just, you think, that's a madman. But crowds of people were really into it. Here's a little bit of fascist propaganda. Once again, we see uh, a, a number of, of tools, implements bound together. Um, maybe it's it's the working man. You know how in, in the Soviet Union we have that symbol of hammer and sickle? Kind of like that, right? Sort of these, these farm implements and, and then uh, an axe of power and so on bound together. I really like this. This is so strangely creepy. It's just wonderful. These are little tiny people down here walking around. And on this building, there is a giant face uh, uh, of Mussolini. And then what's plastered all over Mussolini behind him? Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> if you had to walk by that every day, you know, how would you feel? Would you, by the time the third day, you'd be like, yes, 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 and if it fell, you know, if it wasn't tight and it was loose and it fell and crushed some people, that would be magically funny. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the, uh, the Italians have a kind of glory period, I think. We got, to, we got to experience one of their glory periods in this class. It was really the first thing that we did in this class. Renaissance. Renaissance. But I don't think that the Renaissance is really what the Italian fascists wanted to concentrate on. Roman. Yeah, the Roman Empire is what they want to concentrate on. You know, the Renaissance is great, but is doesn't it seem like the Renaissance sort of leads you in a sort of meandering way towards liberalism? Because isn't the Renaissance about humanism, individual, your individual talents, you know? Uh, and so that's not where they want to go, but Roman Empire with Roman uh, uh, a podium that looks like Roman shields put together and a, and a Roman salute the old Roman salute this this you know use your right hand stick your right hand out kind of thing swearing of oaths and, and you know having little daggers and taking over territory for them that was their glory period for fascists right the Roman Empire is it so they want a, a resurgence of the glorious past of Rome and uh, and adopt all kinds of symbols that they're supposed to tug at the hearts of, of Italians, thinking about their greatness, their national greatness. At one point in time, they were it. Wow, the Roman Empire. Young people are really important in these totalitarian states. And there's, there's, there's groups for boys and groups for girls in all of these totalitarian states. And do you get the magic of that? Do you understand why? Young people in particular are so doggone important to totalitarian states. Because if they get indoctrinated early, the next generation will not go or die. Yeah. Uh, and they have to be indoctrinated by them. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, if you're a fascist or, or a communist, it's a wonderful cycle. Yeah. Kids, no offense, but young people don't know anything from before. You're born and then everything you your mind is filled up, it's like what John Locke says. Your mind is filled up, your blank, you know, the tabula rasa uh, is filled up with whatever it is that we're trying to sell to you education-wise. So here, hopefully you're getting that in a nice way, there you're getting in a fascist way. And the older people who knew something before aren't gonna, they're not gonna buy this in the same way. Does that make sense? They're just, they used to be a communist, or they used to be, uh, you know, somebody who's really into uh, Catholic political beliefs and so on. They got a whole different thing going. They'll, they'll throw out the arm and they'll pretend, but deep down inside, they know something different. And they know maybe that Mussolini isn't a godlike figure, that he doesn't always know what he's doing. Well, why in the heck is it that this nation that wins World War I officially, I get I the air quotes, uh, this World War winner gravitates right after the war to this radical kind of, uh, of political belief. You and I probably understand how a failed Germany, a loser Germany, could turn towards something 
radical, or a loser Russia could turn towards something radical. A winner? Well, the winning wasn't really that great. They didn't really win World War One, quite frankly. They didn't win it on the battlefield. They didn't do particularly well. They had to be rescued by the British and the French in 1917, lest they would have been knocked out of the war. And then at the end, during the, the, the Treaty of Versailles um, and all the peace negotiations and everything, they just weren't given as much as everybody else was given. You might remember that Britain and France got a whole bunch of Middle Eastern territory and they took over German colonies. Well, Italy doesn't get any of that stuff. Italy, Italy gets a little bit of territory from Austria-Hungary, just like they were promised at the beginning of the war, but not much more than that. So no colonies. And then forever, since, since uh, Italy had been created, what's the name of the guy who creates Italy? Who's their Bismarck? Cavour. Yeah, Camilo de Cavour. That guy dies right away. And as soon as he kind of puts most of Italy together, he dies. And, and then Italy is just a mess. It, it doesn't really come together very well. They've taken papal territory. The popes, the successive popes were mad at Italy, the state. They didn't, they didn't tell Catholics to vote in elections to the extent that you could even do that back then. Um, and so it's just a mess for a really long period of time. There's a lot of weak support for shifting governments the, the Italians forever in their history seem to have lots and lots and lots of political parties going from the far left to the far right, even today, 2021. And their, their governments just do not last long. On average, after I think it's World War II, there's a new government every single year on average, all the way up until relatively recently. There was also a post-war depression and unemployment. Can you imagine how that happens? How you get unemployment, big unemployment after a war? All the soldiers come home and then all the war production just runs. Perfect. The, the war production ends, a bunch of people get let go, you got a bunch of soldiers coming home. Before they had, they can get back into producing civilian things and then maybe there's some money that got saved over the war. That could be, yeah. That doesn't really happen. And so um, there's just a lot of post-war depression, unemployment. There's a lot of social unrest. People, I think, are excited by what happened in Russia in 1917. And they, they make attempts at taking over factories, or peasants take, make attempts at taking over land. It seems to be a revolutionary time. It scares the heck out of people who have land and factories. Just a fear of Bolshevism for most people, and then a real desire to have Bolshevism from about 15% or 20% of the people. Mussolini, as a young, young man, is a teacher, he's a socialist, he is a newspaper editor of a socialist newspaper, and by socialist, I don't really mean Marxist, I mean, you know, it's talking about economic fairness and more equality rather than a violent revolution. He is somebody who wants a republic, but they have a constitutional monarchy. He does not like the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church seems to be a conservative block against progress. And so he starts off like this, but then he moves to the right. He becomes an upholder of the monarchy. He becomes an upholder eventually of the Catholic Church, even though he seems to be an atheist. <laughs> and he switched from socialism to nationalism. If you are a socialist. You love, uh, you know, you love the, the 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 people of your country. You love the poor people. You want everybody to have a uh, the same chances of success. If you're a nationalist, you love your country, and and you know you tend to be rather militaristic about your country. Maybe being the best in this uh, in the survival of the fittest kind of competition. Anyway. Uh, he, he puts together or he mobilizes groups of veterans of World War I. These are called um, Fasci di Combattimento, or they're called Squadristi. They are squads of men. They are like uh, what we saw last week with the Germans and their Free Corps or Freikorps. Corps. They are um, veterans of World War I. They like violence. They, they don't shy away from it. They, they enjoy it. It's something that they learned in World War I. They kind of have a hard time giving that up. 
And these squadristi are uniformed still, they wear black shirts. They um, are kind of like a violent political arm of the fascist movement. So they, they assault people, they murder people, they burn things uh, who are opponents of the fascists. Mussolini is creating chaos using these squadristi and then promising the people who don't like the, uh, the squadristi fighting against the communists or the, the, the trade unions or the organized Catholics or whatever, he says that he can, he's the guy who can bring peace to Italy, when in fact he's actually bringing chaos to Italy. So it's going to be really easy for him to bring peace as soon as he tells the thugs to quit them. Here's what they look like. What is he going to do with the trumpet? Da -da 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 -da! And then somebody's going to yell, charge. Yeah. Or maybe it's whatever the retreat is. <laughs> the retreat. There's too many communists on the street. Yeah. Da -da -da -da. And then stick to retreat. They're all young men. What else do you notice about them? They're all white. Yes. A lot of white people in Italy at this point in time. A lot of them have canes. Is yeah. Like cane on people? Those are actually for caning people. Okay. They're not they're not all, you know, wounded from World War One and they all need a cane. A cane is just a nice thing that you can carry around with you to beat other people that isn't really too obnoxious. And they like they can just fake it, like they grew up like in the Oh yeah, I'm a veteran then. Oh that black guy. Yeah. <laughs> Help me crowd the street. Psych, I lied. <laughs> Smack. I was just waiting for you. Uh, I like the bicycle. I want to remind you that bicycles are the automobiles before automobiles. They're a second industrial revolution means of conveyance, a serious means of conveyance for people before there are automobiles. They got, you know, tires rubber tires, and, um, and they're much more important than, than people remember. Well, the troubles then that are going on are the fights between the squadristi, these fascists, and communists especially. That just seems to be a, a, a polar opposite. It makes a heck of a lot of sense. Or socialists. Once again, socialists are, are people who want more economic fairness, people who want perhaps more democracy. They want more um, equality, but they don't want a violent overthrow of anything in the Marxist way. There are Catholics, politically organized Catholics too, who are fighting against the, the fascists, the fascists fighting against uh, the Catholics, trade unionists. There just seem to be a lot of people who are not fascists who the fascists are going to want to attack and, and frighten and get under control. The government, which is true in, in Italy oftentimes, just doesn't know what to do. It has no solutions to the unemployment, uh, to the bad economy, to the violence in the streets. You can imagine if there are a small number of police in any given place, and then there are huge numbers of organized whatever. It's really hard for the police to deal with the organized whatever. You kind of forget that. Um, you know, it's just tough. And, uh, and, and so, the government really doesn't know what to do, and people are increasingly looking for somebody to fix their problems. Well, that person uh, is Mussolini, perhaps. In fact, this is what happens. This is the, the road to power for Mussolini. In October of 1922, Mussolini orders all of his squadristi, all of his fascists, all of these black-shirted thugs to march on Rome to seize power. As they're on their way, the king decides to, I guess, give in to Mussolini. The, the, the king decides to offer Mussolini the, the position of, uh, of prime minister and to form a cabinet. This is the king can do this, right? It's the constitutional monarchy. And they gave him, they gave Mussolini dictatorial power for one year. So he comes to power legally 
on on a, a kind of um, program of threats or or this march seems to be suggesting if you don't give us power we will seize power and so the king's like oh here you, you fix things you try and here's your dictatorial powers well Mussolini doesn't do a, a particularly good job right away. I mean, what's he supposed to? How's he supposed to fix the economy and all that kind of stuff? Um, he is able to sort of quell the violence in the streets by telling his his fascists to stop. But what really tips things and, and makes uh, fascist Italy a dictatorship is kind of an unusual thing that happens um, in the parliament. This is a socialist member of parliament. His name is uh, Matteotti. And he is probably the biggest critic of the fascists and Mussolini. He stands up in parliament and, and tells people, you know, that Mussolini is a thug and a criminal and the fascists are terrible, this, that, and the other. Well, Matteotti was kidnapped and murdered by some of the squadristi. You know, imagine that. <laughs> this is still a parliamentary system. This is still a, a semi-democracy. And, you know, the leader of this other party is murdered by a, a, a rival political party. Those people in parliament then said, this is outrageous. This is murder. The squadristi need to be banned. Mussolini, you're in charge. You know, ban the squadristi. Mussolini says, no, not going to ban the, you know, the stormtroopers of his movement. And so 150 of the members of parliament resign in protest and walk out of the parliament. That's either uh, brilliant or idiotic. Well, what do they hope is going to happen by resigning in mass? What do they, what do they hope is going to happen? The government's not going to work. And, and, well, probably more than that, right? If, if you just lost 150 people in a parliamentary system, wouldn't you call for a new election? And in that new election, with all the people outraged at the death of Matteotti, how are the fascists going to be, you know, how are they going to do in the election? Probably not well. But what happens is they don't call for a new election. Mussolini says, no, no, we can just pass some laws right here, right now, without these 150 guys. And they basically make a legal dictatorship. They arrest the 150 guys who just quit. They arrest a whole bunch of other people. They abolish the, the liberal freedoms of, of, this, uh, of this Italian state. They start to rule by decree. In fact, uh, eventually, the, the, the parliament is no longer needed. They'll have a council of fascists instead. Unions were disbanded. The secret police round people up. A very robust secret police is created to round up the enemies of the state. So, you know, in quotes, totalitarianism. Here's Il Duce. Here's the, the viral macho man leader um, giving speeches all of the time. The speeches are on radio. The speeches are sometimes in movie theaters. You can see what he looks like while he is giving his speeches. You can hear him. And people buy this. They, they, it's, almost like, it's almost like a movie in a way. Uh, sometimes Mussolini goes off and he, he allegedly helps peasants bring in the crops. So imagine, <laughs> I think you probably find this on YouTube. Imagine Mussolini doesn't have a shirt on. He's got kind of weird sunglasses on. And he's like picking up sheaves of wheat and throwing them into a truck. You know? And, and he looks good. He's, he's a muscular guy. <laughs> um, and then other times he is riding on horseback, or other times he's wrestling with a tiger cub. He's kind of like Vladimir Putin before Putin. Really. <laughs> and, and Putin is kind of stealing his stuff in a way. And so uh, it's, it's in media, and people are pretty not savvy about media, not savvy about propaganda, so they're eating up their money. And Il Duce, the leader, is denouncing liberalism as, you know, passe. And, and fascism is, is what everyone's going to go to someday. Capitalism is unfair and, and, uh, and also from the past. Uh, socialism, too, it's a terrible idea. 
um, believe Mussolini, follow Mussolini, listen to Mussolini. He's got all of the answers, and his fascist movement is where everybody's going to be moving to. You kind of saw this happening, in fact, in Eastern Europe. You saw a bunch of Eastern European states moving to the right, some of them semi-fascist states eventually, or at least very right-wing nationalist states. National unity and state management of the economy are what, uh, what fascism is, uh, is promising. This fascist economy has a lot of propaganda in it. So there's always these talks about economic battles. You know, you are battling for wheat production and you're battling against the swamps. You're trying to drain the swamps and start planting things in there. Great public works projects. Put people to work uh, beautifying Rome, bringing Rome to its past glory, creating uh, roads and creating bridges and trying to get, trying to use Italy's natural energy source. Uh, they have quite a bit of hydroelectric uh, power possibilities from, uh, from the mountains that they have. So battle, 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 trying to get Italy on its feet. But, but they, they, as a fascist state, as a hyper-national state, they didn't like to, to trade with other nations. And so they're trying to, trying to do economic self-sufficiency, something called autarky, which really doesn't work very well for Italy. Italy is kind of resource poor, poor in coal, poor in iron ore. It's hard for them to make steel. And let's face it, if you can't make steel, you're not much of a real state. So for all the talk about battle for this and battle for that, really, Italy doesn't achieve the kind of industrialization that they needed. They're a Southern European country. And uh, they don't really achieve the industrialization that they needed for World War II. They have tanks, yes. They have airplanes, yes. They have ships, they have submarines, and so on. But not in the numbers, and not maybe even in the quality that they need for World War II. This will probably kind of be boring to you, but, <laughs> but the economy is divided into 22 corporations or 22 parts and then each corporation uh, was able to decide its wages its working policies the prices the unions all of this stuff are um, controlled by the corporation which is controlled by the state it, it seems to be somewhere it seems to be a kind of communism in a weird way or a kind of uh, of extreme management of the economy but it, it, like I say, it doesn't really work very much. It doesn't work very well. Things like strikes are, are forbidden. Locking out people from jobs is forbidden. Labor unrest is basically banned. And if you want to think of it this way, they get rid of class conflict. They get rid of the social question. They get rid of the, the, the fight between labor and, uh, and management by, by essentially inviting labor and management to sit down at the same table and uh and they say well they pull out a pistol and they put it on the table and say let's get along now and the, and the working class just has to work and the owning class just has to own and and you know kind of locking things down getting rid of class conflict through propaganda and threats of violence and not letting people say anything or be be upset about uh, about their economic future The Roman question was a huge problem, both for Napoleon, if we want to go back to that period of time, and also for Mussolini. You might remember Napoleon was angry, or the Pope was angry about the church lands being stolen in France from the civil constitution of the clergy. The Pope is still angry in the 1920s about the unification of Italy and having his papal states taken away from him. And forever then, 40, 50 years, good Italians couldn't couldn't, good Catholics couldn't be good Italians and vice versa. So Mussolini makes an agreement with the Pope, just like Napoleon made an agreement with the Pope, smooth things over, allow Catholics to be good fascists, good Italians, and good Catholics all at the same time. And it's going to give Mussolini quite a bit of, uh, of, of credibility if the Pope himself will make an agreement with Mussolini, Mussolini will be recognized as a real leader. So that's what happens. February of 1929, 
Pius the, the, the 11th, gets the Vatican officially as an independent state. The Italian state then gives the Catholic Church a bunch of money in compensation for the lands that were taken. Mussolini says that the Catholic Church is the state church of Italy. Can you see how the church is winning? The church is getting a lot out of this. And Mussolini is, is really just getting legitimacy. But they both seem to be right wing. You know what both the Catholic Church and fascists fear the sons of each other? <laughs> you know what the Catholic Church and fascists fear? Marxism. Marxism. The opiate of the masses, right? So it, it makes total sense that these two would be together. Really, the Pope doesn't like it. it doesn't like Mussolini and never actually meets face to face with them. But uh, but just this latter and a quarter of this agreement really does provide them a lot of credibility. Well, there is a lot of militarism and there's a there's a bit of glory in the 1930s. Uh, some of it's kind of pathetic, really, but but we'll talk about that here in a second. Imagine that Mussolini takes over in the early 1920s. He sets his economy to produce as much military equipment as, as possible in the early 1920s and uh, spending a lot of money on that. In order to return to the glory of Rome, in order to carve out an empire. And really the only place where they can carve out an empire at this point in time is to the south. It's in Africa. Ethiopia. It's in Ethiopia. And the Italians had tried at one point in time to take over Ethiopia in the 1890s and had failed. That was very humiliating for them. They go back in the 1930s with new a new generation of, of, of weapons, poison gas, airplanes, um, tanks, and the Ethiopians are still armed with the exact same rifles they had in the 1890s, and it's a slaughter. About 5,000 or so Italian troops die, about 500,000 Ethiopians. It's a brutal war, kind of like what we saw when we saw the, you know, the, the British of firing the rifles at the Zulu warrior, but then just update that. The League of Nations, which is supposed to prevent war from happening and get a, like a negotiating kind of thing going, it only works if both sides actually want to negotiate. And the Italians really are just all about taking over. And so they're able to do that. They take over Ethiopia and make it part of their empire. The emperor of uh, Ethiopia goes in front of the, the League of Nations and asks for help, and everyone's like, no, oh, I can't really do anything. Mussolini also supported the fascist side or the nationalist side in the Spanish Civil War with 50,000 so-called volunteers. This helps the, the Spanish nationalists win their civil war. We'll talk more about that. And this is giving Mussolini some credibility as a military ruler and so on. Good morning again, I so this is Mr. Marshall, your friendly dean. As we head into lunch here today, just a reminder to all students to please make sure that you are using the QR code on the tables that are in the upper gym and in the cafeteria, and that you are checking in what uh, table you are sitting at and submitting that using the Google form. Those areas are going to be a little bit more crowded today now that everybody is back, and we're very excited to see all of your faces. So please make sure you are sitting the appropriate seats and staying as distant as possible in those seat areas. Thank you, Dan Heisel. We appreciate your help and cooperation. Welcome back to everybody. Marshall. You've got a minute. You have to let me do my conclusion. Whether you please take a picture, write it later. I think that, I said this at the beginning, Italian culture prevents totalitarianism. The Italians just don't have this within themselves to get it done. There's some terror, uh, some things run better. Trains allegedly run on time, uh, unemployment is reduced, the economy seems to do a little bit better, but um, you know, it isn't like Nazi Germany, as we'll see, and it isn't like the Soviet Union, which is good. Because in those two states, you've got millions of people who are being killed and millions of and millions more who are really being horribly uh, oppressed. Communism isn't, communism isn't checked. They love that. Liberalism isn't checked. Okay. Italy seems like 
it's a modern, well-oiled machine that it's running better than it ever has before. But really, as you'll see, when it jumps into World War II, it turns out to be a paper tiger. It turns out to be really a very weak state that can't handle a world war like everybody else can. And World War II will destroy fascist Italy really pretty quickly after a number of very humiliating times. Question? Did you take a picture? Uh, you, you showed on the way out. What did I say? Oh, that was terrible. I know, right? Yeah. Totally ruined thank my you. Tell your oh, team, thank you. Well, sorry. I went to Kansas too. They're, they're, they're still in. <laughs> Thanks, you later. USC will beat them. Yeah, probably. Have a nice day, Annika.